very much. Dylan. So thanks uh, to all the organizers uh, for um, bringing us all uh, here and for the invitation. It's very happy to uh, talk here. So yeah, the title of my talk, I think, is a subset of the title of the workshop. Uh, I'm going to talk about trade-offs in statistical learning, computational trade-offs, but uh, not only, multiple uh, trade-offs. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a few, uh, a few uh, things. Uh, I should mention that uh, this is work with uh, my co-authors uh, all over the world. Uh, so Philippe Rigolet, Richard Samworth, Tengya Wang, uh, Venkat Chandra Sakaran, and Jordan Nellenberg. Um, so the, um, a lot of people talk about big data, and I think you know, everyone has their own idea of what it is. I think in general, you can describe it as a broad phenomenon, a collection of challenges in data sciences, much like global warming is a little bit uh, uh, hard to define. But uh, it's a lot of things we're working on, and there are uh, several important aspects, but I think uh, one that, uh, that really uh, we have focused on a lot, at least in statistics, is that data is really connect co collected uh, a lot, and it's not always uh, very useful. Uh, most of the data might not be relevant to the problem at hand, uh, and the data can be also very complex. It might be uh, very uh, different. Um, it, there might be a lot of issues attached to this data. We might want to keep it private. Uh, there might be a lot of errors in it. Um, and so this creates uh, inherently, when we had all this complexity, uh, trade-offs uh, in learning problems. Okay. Um, so yeah, this is uh, one of these uh, introduction, introduction slides when you have uh, a lot of big numbers. The idea is that when we have a lot of data like this and uh, trying to say something about a very high dimensional parameter, so uh, d here can be very large, n can be very large, uh, we often introduce uh, assumptions about the model. So structure, sparsity, we try to make uh, the problem tractable from a statistical point of view by uh, introducing all this. And uh, statisticians' answers tend to be uh, optimizers' problem. This creates uh, combinatorial problems when you just focus on a likelihood method. So if you're doing estimation and you want to solve an optimization problem, this might be intractable. Uh, if you're doing hypothesis testing and want to compute averages on very large sets, uh, this might also be uh, intractable. Um, and so this is, uh, this is a little bit a barrier when our objective is to do computationally efficient uh, statistics. We want to be able to uh, tell a practitioner what's going to happen when they're going to uh, put a method in their computer. Um, and so um, in order to uh, do com statistics in a computationally efficient way, um, the, w the worst case hardness uh, in a likelihood problem it's more or less a zero of order information. It tells us that the first thing that we want to do, the, our first idea, uh, is not going to be possible all the time, uh, but it doesn't say much more, essentially. Uh, first of all, uh, it's possible that there is an algorithm that exists and that will work uh, for frequent instances of an NPR problem. So uh, in clustering, uh, in non-convex regression, a lot of the time we can do a stochastic gradient descent, we can do alternating minimization, and uh, if the right conditions are here, and this will be true for natural signals uh, in general, uh, then we can solve these uh, problems uh, for a lot of instances. Also, what's possible is we can create another optimization problem. We have a proxy functional optimization problem. So this is what we're doing when we're doing convex relaxations on when we're doing the usual trick of transforming the L0 norm into an L1 norm. Um, and so in order, to, uh, in order to say that something is going to be hard uh, computationally uh, from a statistical point of view, we have to focus on average case uh, hypothesis. So not only a worst case hardness. We need to say that some task is hard to achieve uh, consistently and efficiently. Right, so the big question is, can we have our cake uh, and eat it too, right? The beurre and l'argent du beurre uh, in French. So can we have good statistical performance and algorithmic efficiency uh, at the same time? Um, and so um, this, is a, this is a figure that I think a lot of people have uh, started using, uh, describing the statistical error more or less as a function of the running time. So above this line is essentially the things that you can do uh, for which there are algorithms, uh, right? And so below this is essentially the uh, information theoretic uh, threshold that says that no matter what the uh, running time is, 
you can't push your statistical error uh, much below uh, some, uh, some particular threshold. Um, but there's been more and more work that suggests that actually the statistical error will increase uh, when we are constrained on the uh, algorithmic side. Um, so there are two kinds of uh, results uh, around uh, uh, there are two kind of point of views uh, around these kind of results. The first one is to say, well, we have in mind what uh, reasonable computing time means. So there's going to be two regions. It's going to be the one where we have infinite computing time. And so the barrier will be uh, information theory here. Uh, and then there's going to be some other region where uh, we know how to compute things. Uh, and then there's going to be another uh, lower bound that might be higher uh, than the other one. So this is kind of a binary result, but in this, uh, in this kind of setting, we're able to get lower bounds. Uh, and the other one, uh, it's more smooth. Uh, it's, more, uh, it's a finer analysis of uh, this curve. In some sense, there's some work where people explain that they do more and more relaxation, so they get more and more points on upper bounds on this side of the curve. Uh, there's other cases where people look at a particular computation model, so they have more or less a cursor to uh, describe what uh, running time means, and they're able to show that the statistical error for their particular procedure will increase uh, when they do that. But this is yeah the picture uh, I want you uh, to have in mind, at least, uh, at least when we're looking at uh, statistical error and algorithmic efficiently uh, at the same time. So uh, just, to give a, just to give an idea, so for the people who've uh, seen this before, this, since this is the siesta uh, session, uh, you can uh, sleep for 10 minutes and wake up after. So this is a sparse principle component analysis, in particular sparse principle component uh, detection. So we have uh, x1, xn, uh, independent uh, random vectors that are centered. And the question is, uh, are these do these vectors have an isotropic distribution like this? Or is there a sparse unit direction v uh, where there is more variance, in particular theta and more variance? Right? So this is different from uh, um, just principal component detection, where v uh, can be anything. Uh, in high dimension, this is going to be a very complicated problem. There's a, a random matrix theory tells us essentially that we need a very strong signal. We need that the added variance uh, grows with the dimension. So that's going to be a really problematic in a high dimensional setting. So this is why in some sense we focus on sparse vectors, vectors that are like this aligned with the uh, axis. And the signal strength is theta, so it quantifies in some sense the distance between these two distributions. Huh? How different they are. So of course, you know, if uh, theta is very small, this is going to be a hard problem, and if it's very large, it's going to be a, an easy problem, right? Um, and so we have some results uh, actually. So if you only look at the statistics point of view uh, first, we have a really tight result for this. Essentially, uh, we take the uh, empirical covariance matrix and uh, we maximize this quadratic form over unit sparse vectors. So if here we had sigma, the population covariance matrix, uh, we would get uh, one under the null and one plus theta under the alternative. And so we just have to control the deviation when the deviations of this statistic when we don't have uh, the population covariance matrix when we have the empirical one. Um, and you do an analysis of this and you find that theta needs to be uh, of this order. So we don't have D here, we have K, which is in some sense uh, the true dimension of the problem. We lose a logarithmic factor. Uh, but this analysis is tight. From an information theoretic point of view, uh, we have a matching lower bounds more or less uh, of the same order. Uh, but of course, we don't know algorithmically how to uh, optimize this. Um, and um, when we do an analysis with a relaxation, so the usual trick of uh, substituting uh, sparsity assumptions by L1 norms and with an added relaxation of uh, um, doing a transforming, lifting uh, in the semi-definite uh, positive cone. Uh, we have a relaxation by a few people uh, and more in the, uh, in the audience here. But we show that actually you re it requires um, to be effective at discriminating uh, these two hypotheses a much, strong, a much stronger signal. Theta needs to be of the order square root of k squared this time, so this time uh, divided by n. So this can still be better than uh, what we uh, first uh, saw, lambda max, where you need uh, theta to be greater than square root of d over n. 
uh, but it's still a suboptimal uh, result compared to this. So if we go, uh, if we go to the uh, slide I had here, uh, this is just saying uh, we have this barrier here uh, and we have a suboptimal result here. And we don't know if uh, it's because the curve is truly here or it's because our analysis is not really good or because this method is not really good. Right? So the overall picture for the testing problem that we have is that uh, computationally efficient tests seem to require this at first. Uh, and so it seems to say that here, of course, there's no detection that's possible. Here, there's a combinatorial method that works. And here, um, there's uh, only polyno polynomial time methods will start working at this level. Uh, but of course, uh, this is just a suggestion right now. This is just a, an upper bound that we had. Uh, the true situation could be very different. There could be a, an alpha smaller than 2, such that there is an algorithm that starts working uh, at, this, uh, at this level of signal for alpha between 1 and 2. Um, and so, in order to show that this is not the case, uh, we, need to, uh, we need to look at complexity theoretic lower bounds, so a little bit like uh, information theoretic uh, lower bounds um, when we're doing minimax analysis in statistics, uh, but this time taking into account uh, the algorithmic efficiency of the testing procedure. Right? And in order to uh, show that this is uh, not possible, uh, we have to use some assumption from uh, computer science. We have to use the fact that some problem at least is hard um, on average. Okay, so <clears throat> the problem that we're going to uh, look at is the planted click problem. Um, so it's, uh, it's very easy to describe. Uh, it's about random graphs, the easiest uh, possible kind of random graphs where each edge is randomly connected with probability uh, one half independently. So here is the adjacency matrix and when it's like that, the adjacency matrix is essentially pure noise. It's a bunch of up to symmetry uh, IID uh, coefficients. Uh, so here, yeah, the expectation is uh, absolutely a constant one half. Um, and another distribution uh, is the planted click distribution. So this time a click, so it's a subset of completely connected vertices here in orange, is planted in a graph. It's added. So in the adjacency matrix, it's going to be a small square uh, like this. Okay, and now it's hidden. So of course, on a small graph like this, it's kind of easy uh, to see that there is one. Uh, but in general, uh, what we can say is that uh, this random inst instance will have an expectation that's like this. It has a sparse signal structure, a little bit like the original problem that we had on sparse PCA, where it was either something where everything was completely independent, it was all pure noise, or there was a sparse signal uh, that was present. Uh, okay, and we need to differentiate uh, these two possible cases. And of course, here it's just a uh, schematic. The clique is uh, represented as uh, one uh, square, but of course it could be everywhere. Um, and so that's what makes it a truly hard problem because we would have to look uh, everywhere to find it. Okay. Um, so if we just uh, look at this problem from a you know, purely uh, probabilistic or statistical point of view, uh, under this hypothesis you can show that the, the, uh, the largest clique will have a size smaller than 2 log m with very high probability. And under this alternative, it will have a size greater than kappa by definition, because we've planted a clique of size kappa. So of course, when uh, kappa is greater than 2 log m, well, it's possible, in theory, uh, to detect the presence of this clique. Um, but of course, it's empty hard uh, to uh, check uh, the value uh, of this number. So, People have looked at other methods to try and uh, detect or even estimate uh, the position of this clique. So what they found is that you have some polynomial time uh, detection method that works, but requires uh, this size to be greater than square root m. m is the size of the, um, is the number of vertices, it's the size of the graph. Um, and there's a very strong hypothesis uh, in theoretical computer science that says that Essentially, it's impossible uh, to do better. If uh, kappa is a power of m that's smaller than one half, uh, then there's no polynomial time method that works even uh, to distinguish uh, these two uh, distributions. Um, and so this assumption is considered pretty strong for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, a lot of very smart people have tried to improve this result and haven't been able to. So that's the uh, uh, authority uh, argument. 
uh, a lot of people have also shown that if you focus on particular computational models, uh, so Markov chains, uh, all kinds of uh, relax convex relaxation for this problem, uh, square root m is where things start to fall apart. Um, and now people have used it uh, as a primitive uh, to prove the hardness of other things. So to prove that uh, it's hard to approximate Nash equilibria, uh, that some uh, cryptographic systems are secure. Uh, and so it is considered uh, pretty secure. And uh, this is something that we can use uh, to show that other problems uh, in uh, statistics are hard. We will be a primitive uh, for average case reduction. We'll show a link between problems and we'll say, well, if there was an algorithm that would work really well for this statistical problem uh, that we have, so like sparse PCA that I talked about in the beginning, um, where well we could modify, uh, we could take, oops, we could take a graph as input, modify it a little bit, uh, and then put it into the algorithm that we have for original statistical problem, and it would contradict um, this hypothesis. Okay. Uh, and so that's what we've been able to do. We've been able to show that you can link these two problems of planted leak and, uh, and sparse PCA. And we've been able to show that any kind of detection uh, below this uh, threshold uh, would contradict uh, this hypothesis. So the take home message here is that when you focus only on computational efficient method uh, for, uh, for detection, at least in this problem, there is a gap of square root k. Right, so in the curve that I had in the beginning, they are really in these two regions, so uh, infinite computing time and reasonable computing times, uh, a gap between uh, the barriers for statistical efficiency. Okay, and uh, the same result is true uh, for uh, estimation. So this is something uh, we've, uh, we've worked on with some uh, colleagues at Cambridge later. Um, the picture uh, is a little bit more complex because then there are two metrics uh, there are the uh, size of the signal and then there's the speed of convergence. It's not just, you know, can you detect or can you not, it's how close can you detect. And we show again that in the certain signal, um, in certain signal regimes, um, there is a link between estimating V and uh, recovering the clique. And so we're able to show that really when you focus on uh, these, again, computationally efficient uh, methods, there is again a gap of uh, square root K. But so, so here is still a conjecture of this gap, right? Because uh, you don't have, you have not proven the bound. What you have is you say a lot of people have tried to solve this problem and failed. Absolutely. But I mean, you could also argue that uh, P different from NP is an unproved conjecture. And so maybe we can compute lambda k max in polynomial time. But sure. But was this kind of problem of the similar sort of P equals NP? It's not, no, it's not as hard. Uh, it's not as uh, secure in some sense as uh, P equals NP. It's possible that this conjecture is false and that p uh, different from np uh, still stands however you it's been shown that you cannot uh, if you want to if you want to prove lower bounds uh, for things in the average case in uh, general uh, it seems very likely that you cannot use worst case assumptions uh, uh, to spare you the technical details uh, the whole hierarchy of uh, all these problems would collapse if that were true so it's uh, it's assumed that you need an average case assumption. Uh, you can't prove these results just based on p different from np. Uh, so you're always going to have to link uh, different problems in average case with some possible distribution. Um, other questions before I close the sparse PCA parenthesis? <coughs> Can you show it is equivalent to the quantitative problem or is it only one way? No, that's a very good question, but uh, it's not, it, it's not clear uh, that it's always equivalent. Uh, when some uh, parameters are very large, you can show that and you can uh, build uh, the, uh, the reduction the other way around as well. But it's not in very natural uh, parameter regimes. OK. Um, so this was one particular problem where you cannot have your cake. Uh, and elite too, but of course this is not at all a universal situation. Uh, in the uh, last few decades we've seen the power of convex relaxation in uh, statistics and machine learning. Uh, we've seen also that uh, more, even more recently there's been I think more focus on that, the, f the fact that uh, 
a lot of things will work by magic a lot of the time, even if uh, SGD is not supposed to work, uh, it will work. Uh, you can actually prove that it will work a lot of the time. So there's a lot of situations where you can actually have uh, these two things at the same time. And uh, other people yeah, have worked on uh, showing that you can have statistical performance and some other thing as well. It doesn't have to be a computational efficiency. Um, so some people have worked on privacy, data security, uh, robustness to errors, uh, the fact that data can be distributed. Um, so you can have statistical performance and some other thing and eventually lose only a little bit of statistical performance uh, when you do that. So now the question that I had in mind is, uh, well, can you have all three? Can you have your cake in it too and the cherry on top as well? Um, and I, I like to be a buzzkill. I like to have uh, negative results in general. So I focused on problems where you cannot have all three at the same time. So you can have two if you want. Uh, you can have statistical performance and algorithmic efficiency. Uh, you can have statistical performance and some other thing. But I've noticed that in a lot of these uh, analysis, a lot of the time, uh, they sh it is shown that this works for the MLE or for something that has a lot of strong assumptions. Uh, but I've wondered, you know, can you show that sometimes it doesn't work for all estimators? In particular, can you show that it doesn't work for, for some algorithmically efficient uh, estimators? So can we, uh, are there cases when we have these two, but not uh, this? So uh, one example that's actually uh, pretty natural that I'd like to talk about now uh, is between uh, statistical efficiency, uh, algorithmic efficiency, and the fact that you can distribute uh, your data. So this is uh, something uh, with related to sparse uh, matrix signals. Okay, so there's a lot of motivations uh, to have distributed data. Um, first of all, it can be, uh, as uh, Ohad said uh, yesterday, too big to store or move around, but you can also have, uh, you can also have other type of constraints. So the data maybe cannot be shared freely. So, you know, you have a country and you have data sets uh, in different parts of this country. Um, and maybe, you know, these are hospitals, they're not willing to share their data, uh, but they're maybe ready to share one average or small part of uh, their data. The question is then, uh, can you do as well as if you have all the data? Um, so this is, the, uh, this is the classical picture in this case. Um, you have x1, xn that are distributed with uh, some uh, according to some distribution and you want to estimate something about this distribution. So this is when you have all the data and you have some good guarantees uh, for theta hat, uh, deviation bound guarantees with high probability, etc. Uh, the question is when you distribute the data like this, when you cut up uh, in a lot of small blocks, uh, capital M blocks with uh, N over M samples, can you do as well when estimation can only be done locally. So you have a bunch of local estimators uh, and then you aggregate them. So here I wrote an average, but it doesn't have to be an average. It can be uh, all, kinds, uh, all kinds of things. And uh, here, yeah, here it's assumed that uh, all these uh, blocks are IID. And so, um, of course, there are practical advantages to doing things like this. So first of all, as I said in the beginning, it can be a constraint. Uh, you know, you might have security issues or size issues. But also you have uh, running time advantages uh, when you do things like this, right? So if you are able to completely uh, distribute uh, all the computations, uh, it will divide the computing time a lot. And even if you have to do it, uh, you know, one, uh, one by one, even if you have to do first the computations for this one and then for this one and then for this one, et cetera, um, then it will still speed up computations because you're, uh, you have a smaller sample size uh, to begin with. Right, so if you have n to the 1, 4 uh, blocks and the running time is n to the power of 5, then you can improve even when you have to do it them one by one, uh, this power. Okay? So of course there are issues when you do things like this. You have a loss of, a loss of signal, right? Each uh, local estimator is based on less samples. So the question is, how does it scale? Uh, and of course that's going to be different for different problems. If you're doing an average, well, everything commutes, right? So uh, here, when you are computing this, it will be equal to the uh, average of them all. 
but for a lot of problems, it doesn't commute like this and it doesn't scale really well. Uh, what people have focused on a lot recently are positive results for this. They're saying that there's a large class of estimators where you can parallelize things well. Uh, um, things based on convex minimization, so if you have uh, strong assumptions uh, on your MLE, uh, you can show that, you know, you analyze the geometry of this problem and you can show that actually you have a minimal loss when you do uh, things like this. Um, so the natural question is that I had in the beginning is can this be extended to any kind of estimator for theta? Uh, in particular in situations where you cannot compute uh, the MLE when this is not a convex problem, uh, can you do anything? And so um, the problem that I found that is uh, pretty natural uh, but that raises some issue uh, is pretty simple. So you have a, a big matrix of observations. Uh, the mean, so the signal is AA transpose for a sparse vector A. Um, and the noise is just a bunch of IID coefficients and your matrix is of size N. Okay? And so uh, just to uh, fix all the scaling, we assume that the AIs in the signal are constant when there is signal with probability k over n, but most of the time they are equal to zero, right? So k is more or less the number of these uh, non-zero coefficients. Um, and the noise, as I said, is uh, independent coefficient, so it's centered with variance one, has the usual sub-Gaussian terms. Uh, and in this problem, uh, A is sparse, and we fix this sparsity to be uh, a constant times square root n, because this is where uh, interesting phenomena uh, phenomena appear. So, yeah. why do you fix the variance to one? Because you lose the like, possibility of having the scaling in alpha. I'm sorry? A is between, between one half and one. So, yeah, I mean, half and one are not, uh, it can be any constant. Should be not allowed to have more noise? You're fixing the amount of noise. Sorry. Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm fixing all of these because this is where the uh, interesting stuff happens. Oh, so you chose one on purpose because this is uh, where things get difficult? Well, uh, this is, yeah, this is where uh, things start to be interesting when you start to distribute uh, your data. But, I mean, you could change things a little bit. You could say that uh, alpha I, uh, is smaller than this and then you have to change the sparsity and then uh, the same kind of phenomenon will appear, but uh, this is one example where interesting things appear. Okay? Um, and so, uh, what you want to do here is estimate A, or even something very simple, the mean of the alpha i's. So you can think of this as uh, the study of an epidemic. Uh, so you have, a bunch of, uh, you have a bunch of profiles for patients and you don't really know yet what the disease looks like, so you compare all their, all their files. Uh, and if you have all the patient's files, you have this big matrix of observation and the idea is that whenever uh, they both have the disease, well, uh, their profiles look alike and something uh, spikes up. Right? This, is, uh, this is the problem we want to look at. Uh, but of course, um, we don't actually have access to all this data. Uh, these patients are in certain cities all over the country, uh, their profiles are in a hospital and this is not going to be shared. So the only data that actually exists is this one. Um, and so you have n to the uh, epsilon for any constant uh, epsilon blocks. Uh, and in each block you have n over m uh, profiles or samples. And so the question is, of course, you know, is the statistical problem um, still possible? First of all, is it possible when you haven't distributed the data? Then is it possible uh, when you do this, and then how does algorithmic efficiency uh, come in the mix? So, uh, one thing where we can see, first of all, that there are going to be issues is that even if we do a very simple uh, heuristic for al alpha, the mean of the alpha, I, the sum of the coefficients, we're going to see uh, why things uh, become complicated uh, when we divide the data like this. Um, so if we sum all the coefficients of this matrix, because we've added, uh, we've made the mean of some coefficients higher, so the overall mean uh, should, have, uh, should be higher as well, uh, we'll see that we can estimate alpha up to some small constants with higher probability. And so if this constant that comes from the sparsity, so the sparsity is c times square root n, um, if this constant is large enough, then we can detect the presence of signal 
uh, and we can have a pretty good estimate uh, for alpha. So this is when we have all the data. This is the baseline result, uh, the benchmark in some sense. Okay, but when we cut up the data like this, uh, then the sparsity locally, when you uh, when you compare it to the uh, size of the block, uh, has changed. When you zoom in, essentially things look more sparse. Uh, you can uh, you can uh, do the computations, and you'll see that k epsilon, so the sparsity in one block scales uh, with n epsilon, the size of the block, uh, with a smaller constant than one half here. Yeah. Um, and so if you try to sum in each individual block, uh, then the uh, added mean will be smaller than the size of the deviations, and things will not work. So I mean, here you can be, uh, uh, you know, challenge uh, what I'm saying a little bit by saying, well, first of all, maybe it's just, you know, a simple heuristic. Uh, maybe this one doesn't work, but other things will work. And you can also say, well, you know, of course you've made the problem harder, now there's less data, so maybe you've made the problem impossible by, uh, you know, having less data like this. So first off, we'll see that actually you don't make the problem impossible when you cut up the data like this. It's still possible to estimate A uh, when you only have access to the small uh, diagonal blocks like this. Um, so. Uh, first, we do the analysis when all the data uh, is available, uh, and we start with uh, and the analysis is going to be first based on a sparse uh, spectral study. So for now, we don't care about computing time at all. So we are assuming again that we can maximize uh, this quadratic form, uh, and the same type of results that we had for sparse PCA will still hold. We'll have a deviation for uh, this vector that will be governed by two things by the spectral gap uh, for the matrix A, and by the norm, some norm of the, uh, of the added noise. Right? And so you can control this norm of the added noise, you can uh, control by looking at the parameters of your problem uh, the spectral gap, and you find a bound uh, that goes to zero uh, when n grows, and so you have, when n is very large, a good uh, idea of what this vector is. This allows you to create a good candidate set of uh, non-zero uh, coefficients. So these are people where you have a strong assumption that they have the disease. Uh, you show that it has a good intersection with the true support of A. And by doing this, then you can do a second phase of refinement and you look at uh, essentially the profiles that are highly correlated with uh, those in W. Uh, and you look at these highest coefficients and this allows you to recover uh, the whole set. So this is when you have all the data, but the same analysis with the parameters changing just a little bit will still work when you do it locally uh, on each block. You will still find that this will grow uh, to z will go to zero when uh, n uh, grows. Um, the speed will be a little bit slower. Uh, of course, we have a little bit less samples, uh, but it still works, uh, and we're still able. Uh, this should be a W at S, right? We have in each block one candidate set. We do the second phase also in each block, and it works. So the problem has not been made impossible from a statistical point of view by cutting up the data like this. Uh, but of course, the method that I've presented here uh, is uh, computationally uh, hard. So now we could say, well, maybe this problem is computationally hard whether or not it's in a distributed uh, setting. Um, and actually, it's not. So you can uh, do the same analysis for just a spectral method. So you forget about the sparsity assumption here. Um, and so now you'll have a different norm uh, because this max maximization problem is less constrained. Uh, you'll still have the spectral gap here. And when you analyze this, uh, so this is why we chose uh, k to be of uh, order square root n. You have something here that is uh, less than one. So you have a non-trivial angle between your estimated vector and the true vector. Uh, this means that, that the candidate set uh, will have still a pretty good intersection with the true support and the second phase will still work. The only thing you need for the second phase to work is to have something that's not like one over square root d uh, in, uh, in this norm. So small constant is fine. Okay, so the problem initially 
uh, is not hard computationally. You can just do a spectral analysis and it will work. And uh, you can do it uh, in a distributed manner with a sparse spectral method. The question is, can you do the same thing as you know, when I went from this slide to this slide and said there was only a minimal loss? Uh, can you then do the same analysis in each block here? So, of course, since I'm asking the question, it's not possible. Uh, you uh, do the same analysis of the operator norm of the noise, of the spectral gap uh, in each small block, and you'll find that this uh, upper bound here is non-informative. This is a distance on the sphere in some sense. This is a bounded distance. So if you have a bound that goes to infinity, it doesn't tell you anything. This could be, I mean, any vector on the sphere satisfies this. And so you cannot do the second phase and you have no information. So again, this is saying, well, this particular method doesn't work, but you know, maybe something else, uh, something else will. Uh, so here our objective is to have a statistical procedure for A that satisfies various properties. So this is kind of uh, the picture that I showed in the beginning between uh, having your cake wanting to uh, eat it too and having something else on the side. Um, so you can have these two things at the same time. So you, know, you can solve the statistical problem by and have the data being completely distributed. This is the sparse spectral uh, method. You can also solve uh, your statistical problem if you have all the data uh, with just a simple uh, spectral approach. Uh, but if you want to do all three at the same time, uh, so far, uh, everything we try doesn't work. Um, and so you can do the same thing as in the, uh, as in the previous problem I talked about, actually. Um, so the global idea is that if you want to uh, estimate A in a distributed manner, uh, it means that you're estimating all the AS. Uh, so if I go back to yeah, this block picture, right? So uh, this is the only data that exists. Uh, and so if you want to estimate the whole matrix or the vector A, well, the only way you can do it when this is the data available and you're going to do estimation locally on uh, each of these is to estimate uh, all the AS uh, well. If there's, uh, if there's one part, if there's one region where you're not uh, recovering the support, uh, then this is, going to, uh, um, this is going to be a problem as well uh, when you want to estimate uh, the whole matrix, right? So if you could estimate the whole matrix in a distributed way, it would mean that you can estimate all the small blocks uh, individually. Um, and now the signal strength in each individual block is too small, the sparsity uh, is too small as well. Um, these two are related. And in particular, it's going to be uh, hard now for computationally efficient procedures. So we also do a reduction uh, from the planted click problem uh, that I talked about uh, in the beginning. Uh, and we show that if you have uh, these graphs, so these two possible uh, distributions on graphs, and you look at the adjacency matrix, uh, do some manipulations, add some noise to the coefficients, etc. You will transform the adjacency matrices that come from these problems in instances of this problem. Right? Here, the connection I think is even more evident than uh, with sparse PCA. And in particular, you will uh, you will you will show that if you had something that worked uh, for these small matrices for each local estimator, uh, then you could use this to detect the presence of cliques, uh, of very small cliques uh, in graphs, which would contradict uh, this assumption. Right? So in the end, we don't uh, have that. Right? We're able to show that this is the picture. You can do uh, statistics uh, in an algorithmically efficient way, uh, you can do it in a distributed way, but you cannot do both at the same time. Um, and I think so, I mean, this is more the big picture message uh, that I want to convey here, is that uh, when we look at, um, when we look at uh, statistical problems and we want to say that, you know, we're able to add something uh, to our statistical procedures, I think, you know, this something that we add uh, should not be considered uh, 
individually, we should consider all of these at the same time, because otherwise we'll have uh, multiple trade-offs. So this is why uh, the title of my talk was uh, trade-offs, uh, plural. In statistical learning, we can have uh, impossibility results uh, when we want to uh, have a lot of things at the same time in a statistical problem. Um, there's, um, another, uh, there's another type of uh, trade-offs that I've uh, studied as well. So this is uh, work I mentioned in the beginning uh, with uh, Jordan Ellenberg. Um, now, the other thing that uh, we want to add in this problem is not uh, di distributed, uh, distributed computation or distributed data, it's robustness to errors. Um, so it's a statistical problem that's uh, a little bit uh, more of a toy problem. It's a bit less natural than the one I talked about, uh, the two ones I talked uh, about before. It's related to uh, satisfiability. But the overall picture, even without uh, going too much into details, uh, is that in this problem, optimal statistical performance can be reached by an NP-hard method. So this is like sparse PCA, this is like uh, the uh, other problem in, on sparse matrices that I talked about in the beginning. Uh, and two improvements can be made uh, to, this, uh, to this problem uh, with small statistical loss, but they can be made individually. Um, so one of the things you can do is you can use uh, another statistical procedure that will be computationally efficient. Uh, you will have some statistical loss with this procedure, but it will be minimal. Uh, and the other thing that you can do is you can uh, allow for a constant portion of errors. So you can also change differently uh, your statistical procedure. Um, and now if you know, even 99% of your data uh, is pure trash, um, then you'll still be able to uh, detect complete noise uh, from the presence of a little bit of signal uh, in this problem. And the issue is you cannot do both at the same time. So again in this, there's this type of picture when we can have statistical efficiency uh, with two other things individually. So here, either robustness to errors or computational efficiency. Uh, but every, the only way we can make an improvement is to not be able to uh, do the other one. Uh, the two improvements cannot be made uh, simultaneously. And so we actually have a negative result uh, that tells us that there is an issue uh, in this problem if we try to do uh, two at the same time. So it's not related to uh, the planted click problem. It's related to uh, another problem in theoretical computer science called learning parity with noise. Uh, another one of these problems that uh, is assumed to be harder on average. Ah, like because of PNP or the new, the unique game stuff? Uh, where no, I mean, no, it's not, it's not unique games. It's not P uh, different from NP either. It's just, uh, so uh, people, people have tried and uh, not be, uh, I mean, it's the same kind of situation as Planted Click. So people have tried and not been able, not be able to improve the results that exist. People have uh, also shown, this is actually uh, one of the first kinds of computational lower bounds that existed, that if you focus on one particular model of, uh, statistical queries, so you count the number of queries that you can make to an oracle. Uh, this is going to be uh, this is going to be problematic, and this is kind of related to this whole literature on uh, statistical algorithms that uh, Vitaly Feldman is uh, developing. So, essentially, these are problems that are hard when you're only using averages. So you're always a bit like fuzzy in what statistical over bounds are right here, okay? Yeah. But you see that for computation, it's always fuzzy. Like you need to have like people LP or can you formally define what it means to be hard computationally? What is a computation lower bound precisely? Computational lower bound precisely is saying uh, if you look at, um, if you have an algorithm that improves the present, uh, you know, assumed bound that we have, then we'll, it will contradict you can construct another algorithm that will contradict something. Um, people NP? No, no, some that will perform better also than thought possible in another problem. It's always it's always beating what is like a, a big conjecture. That yeah. like, like P different from NP, I think this is like big conjecture, yeah. and there is, but you, 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 don't, you don't always allude to this. Sometimes you do something which is different. Yeah. And maybe not as widely conjectured. Absolutely, but as I uh, as I said uh, to Simon, uh, people have looked at this because you know people are. I mean, this is true in you know all computational learning theory. People are well aware that this is an issue, uh, but 
they've shown that it's very likely, um, so you know, uh, unless the whole polynomial hierarchy collapses, it's very likely that you cannot show hardness of learning in average by using just p different from np or a worst case uh, assumption. So essentially, I mean, all, uh, not all assumptions are equal. So, you know, p different from np is much, much, much stronger than the assumptions we're using here. Uh, so, um, but it is still an unproved conjecture, right? It's not as clean as a statistical lower bound. Well, you know, you have Fano, uh, you have uh, bound on the, total, uh, on the total variation distance. So, of course, it's not as clean as that. And, you know, there's no uh, big recipe or big method that tells you how to construct lower bounds, right? In statistics, you have all these theorems that tell you, you know, you compute KLs, you compute chi square divergences, and you find, uh, you find these lower bounds. Here, there's a little bit of a recipe, which is essentially uh, you find one of these problems uh, in theoretical computer science that's assumed to be really hard on average, and you try to see if it's, re you know, if it's related uh, to your problem. Or you reverse engineer it and try to find a statistical problem that's uh, linked to one of these assumptions. Um, but it's more or less something that you're always going to have to do if you want to uh, say anything negative about uh, computation, about you know, uh, statistics uh, done in a computationally efficient manner. Uh, and I, ag I agree. I mean, this is, I think, uh, in my next uh, conclusion slide. Uh, it'd be interesting to have a finer analysis of these trade-offs. Um, but I think this is, uh, this is always kind of related to, uh, to upper bounds, right? It, it's nice, it would be nice to have, so I'm going back to the beginning, but I think I still have a bit of time, so it's okay. Uh, yeah. Right, so it'd be really great to be able to say, you know, uh, with proof, without any assumption, uh, First of all, there is a lower bound here that's different from just you know the information theoretic lower bound, and also we can describe you know in a very uh, fine manner how this works, where exactly this boundary uh, is. This would be really great uh, for practitioners, right? They tell you you know have this much running time. Uh, this is the added error you're going to make, right? So the you know that way they're able to manage all these trade-offs, etc. That's a little bit possible when you focus on upper bounds, right? Or when you focus on one particular alg algorithm. So, you know, you, um, your estimator is going to be based on the iteration of some kind of gradient descent or something else. And then you have T and you can show uh, maybe a lower bound for this particular optimization problem for this particular estimator. Right, so going back, uh, going back to the end. Um, so, the results that we have here are computational limits to doing estimation in a distributed manner or in a manner that's uh, robust to a lot of errors. Um, one thing um, that I didn't completely talk about because uh, essentially we're still working on it is you can avoid some of these issues if that's what you're interested in by uh, adding some redundancy. So here in some sense the very nice uh, the very nice aspect of having your data like this is, is that if someone gets their hand on that, then they cannot say anything about, um, about the whole data set, even if they have you know, uh, a lot of computing time. As long as it's not infinite, uh, it's going to be fine. So essentially, if you uh, replicate in a minimal way your data by uh, creating these blocks, essentially, that don't exist yet, uh, you could create a situation where uh, if anyone has access to one of these blocks individually, in a reasonable computing time, they're not going to be able to extract anything from the data. So in some sense, it's still secure. But you can, still, you can now do things because essentially now the whole data exists. So you can you know, sum all these coefficients and a central agency that communicates with all these data centers would still be able to say that something is going on. So, this is something interested. If you, this is something that could be nice if you're interested in, you know, posi positive results, fixing these uh, issues a little bit. Um, and then there are more questions uh, about, you know, if you if you think that this is actually a good thing, uh, if you think that uh, the, your data set now, has some, in some sense, has been made uh, more secure uh, by no one being able to um, by no one being able uh, to look at it and extract anything from it. 
Can you systematically make data sets more secure? Can you have a data set, transform it into something that looks like what I had uh, this past submetrix uh, signal problem, uh, and now um, make it secure to someone who's bounded in computing time? So this is a little bit related to issues in cryptography, but uh, more from a statistical point of view. And then, as I said, uh, in, uh, when I first came to this slide, uh, can we have a finer analysis of these trade-offs? Um, and you know, what are we going to have to pay in some sense uh, to have a finer analysis of these trade-offs? Are we going to have to focus on one particular uh, model? Uh, are we going to have only upper bounds? Um, so it's complicated uh, to do lower bounds already in this very you know, binary manner with a lot of conjectures, etc. Uh, it's going to be even harder if you don't have all these things. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is uh, supported by the ASIC Newton Trust. So thanks a lot uh, for your attention. Are there some questions, comments? So in optimization, you get lower bounds by assuming a specific model of computation. Mm -hmm. like combination of gradients. Yes. Could you imagine something about the graph problem where you access like graphs locally and by sequence of local moves? Yeah. Is, there, is, is there already like lower bounds yeah. assuming this? Um, yeah. Uh, Monzanari and one of his students has uh, worked on that. So I think in one of my uh, slides on trade-offs, I had something, uh, I had a reference. So yeah, so in the planted click problem, uh, they've shown that they have a method that works well for uh, estimating uh, clicks of say square root n times a small constant. And they've shown that if you have so the same kind of methods you were talking about, local methods essentially that are based on you know, looking at these trees so you walk around locally in the graph, they're not able to improve that constant. Um, so there are, there are methods like this. And I think it'd be interesting also to uh, Look at uh, look at situations when you're saying again, you know, we have uh, we're only using gradients or Hessians or inverses, etc. But the data is distributed. Is that creating also uh, these types of problems? I think that would be really interesting. It'd be based on information theory, uh, but you have to make some assumptions about your reason. But yeah, I think that's an uh, open, interesting problem. Yeah. So this is more of a <coughs> comment than a question, but. Uh, so you're absolutely right that uh, understanding the fine-grained behavior uh, like in terms of front end is very difficult because we don't really have very good tools to get lower bounds in terms of the run time. Maybe yeah. we can say something that's polynomial, not polynomial, and even, even then, then you need yeah. assumptions. Um, but I think sometimes you also have more information theoretic quantities mm -hmm. um, which you can prove things about without making any assumptions, which are still a proxy for the runtime, so things like memory or the amount of communication you have. So like for some of the problems you mentioned, say in sparse PCA, if you show that uh, like to get something optimal, you would need the, uh, say, uh, memory or amount of communication with scales quadratically with the dimension, then you could argue that that kind of method probably won't be efficient. And you can ask what happens if we let's say something that is linear in the dimension. And, at least when you ask it this way, you can understand, I think, much better. You can get a finer grained analysis. I, I really agree with your comment. Uh, and this is a little bit what also I was describing when I was saying, you know, you, you have some given method or framework. So, you know, you're creating a proxy, as you said, for running time. Uh, and then you have bounds based on information theory. So I think there's been a uh, I mean, at least recent work that I'm aware of on sparse linear regression with bounded memory, and there's been a lot of things uh, like that when you bound a uh, computation. The only issue that I have with this is that sometimes you have, a, so like stati statistical algorithms, you have a, you have a framework um, where, you know, you're saying, well, in this framework I'm able to show, uh, inform, you know, true bounds, true lower bounds based on information theory that kind of suggest uh, this kind of trade-off between running time and error. But actually you find something like Gaussian elimination that doesn't fall into this framework and that actually allows you to solve this problem. So it's, then you have the other problem where it's hard to argue that your framework is a true description of running time. Um, so this is, yeah, this is something I'm a little bit worried about uh, 
creating a framework, doing all these, uh, doing all these bounds, and then someone noticing that actually something really easy doesn't fall into that framework. Other comments or questions? I had one last question. <coughs> In the distributed setting, so you, there is a gap between what you can do uh, uh, distributed and what you can do with the full information. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine, at least for upper bounds, uh, if, you for, so if you force the hospitals to share part of the information, to have a continuum between uh, the full information and the, having only the diagonal blocks? So, uh, I've, this is something I've uh, looked at and essentially uh, having a continuum like this is kind of hard. Essentially, as soon as you ask them to share even a little bit of information, then suddenly you can recover everything. Uh, so this can be good uh, if you know, you're a central agency and you really want to know if there's an epidemic going on. And so you tell the hospitals, come on, you have to share at least a little bit. We'll make sure that it you know, stays in some secure data sets. No one has all the data. It cannot fall into the wrong hands. Um, but really quickly, you can recover everything. So this is good in some sense. Okay, so uh, the positive result? Yeah, the positive the result is quite fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, trying to do it in a smoother way uh, is kind of hard, I think, uh, at least in this model. Maybe it's also an issue with the model. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks again.